So, and I will be muting everybody to start with and uh, just for the initial meditation. And after that, you are welcome to uh, unmute yourself and share whatever you feel like sharing. So to start with, if we can uh, turn our attention within. Resting as we are. Doing nothing, nothing that you need to do. And welcome your experience just as it is. In uh, welcoming, we are the welcoming. It is not something that we do. Rather, it is that which we are. Effortless welcoming. Not an activity of the mind. but uh, an expression of our nature, an expression of being. Notice the stillness. the spaciousness of awareness. sensations may arise on the screen. Notice the breath, gentle flow. The warmth of the body. If I gave you all my love, I say, would that make you happy? Would that make you happy?
when we are not defending anything, when we're not holding on to anything, there is no disturbance. The waves on the surface of the ocean do not disturb the ocean. So we remain open welcoming because that is the true expression of being and in being together there is that deep resonance of being because being is shared by all of us like water is shared by all the waves. In fact, without water, there are no waves. So we recognize in this moment our reality as consciousness. which may take the form of hearing or the form of the sensation of your feet on the ground. take on the form of thought, an image, a memory. But consciousness is not disturbed by the form, by the perception, by the thought, by the sensation. because it, it has no agenda. The freedom of being. The creativity. The infinite possibilities. We welcome it all. What?
notice how when a stone is thrown in the pond, there are ripples. But in time, the ripples dissolve in the vastness of the lake. There is no argument between the ripples or the lake or the stone. There's no argument. Can we can we invite this understanding in our life? To explore this possibility of no disturbance at the deep level. to be still when it is appropriate to be still and quiet, to recognize within ourself the appropriateness of stillness, to feel, to sense, to listen, freshly, openly, without the need to adopt uh, the old patterns, the patterns of protection. Defensiveness. Avoidance, blaming. Can we explore the entire realm of our experience and inviting ourselves to the peace? without judgment. With patience. And love. It is our particular understanding that heals not just here, but throughout the entire realm of being. The healing which is, which comes from truth, from understanding that I do not exist in time and space. That I refers to this transparent, effortless, aware presence. Not I, the man, the woman, the person, the mother, the father, the daughter, the son. Not I, the some body form or some mind form. But I, the reality that perceives right now, the I, the, the reality that hears, that is formless. 
invisible yet undeniable. There is nothing we lack as consciousness, meaning there is nothing we lack in truth, in reality. We don't need to live carrying the past. Past traumas and past history and stories. Because the past is, is gone. It did what it did. It was what it was. Can we be the joy of being, the freedom of being, the light of being, the happiness of being? In this moment, not as a person, not my happiness versus your happiness, but the freedom, the joy, the beauty, the love of being, of awareness, of consciousness. We cannot at the same time be this person with my personal fears and stories and personal beliefs, this limited mortal body-mind, and at the same time to be the joy of being, the transparency of being. So we do not hold on to past identity. We do not meet meet each other from the past with the past. But we meet each other freshly, openly, undefined. Not defining myself in any way, neither defining you in any way. 
so that I welcome you as myself, as this one beingness. I embrace you as I embrace myself. So I, I hear these words and deep within I, there is understanding. The recognition, the recognition of that which is the reality of consciousness. And I welcome this recognition lovingly, patiently. like the surface of the pond welcomes the sunshine that shines on, on its surface. Like the bird welcomes the, the branch that it hops from and the branch that it hops to. So in our exploration, in our inquiry, in our investigation, we inquire into truth that which is unchanging and changeless across time, across space. That which is unchanging irrespective of circumstances and irrespective of situations. It is for us to discover and live according to our understanding, our discovery. Not about the mind which is so relative and so conditioned from country to country, nation to nation, family to family, but according to that which is unconditioned.
So, if you have any questions, anything that you would like to explore, please make sure you unmute your mic. Any questions? Any questions? Magdi. Hello, Mina. Hello. Would you please say something about free will? Yes. And about non to be the doer? Yes. Obviously, we, we do have a freedom. We choose, we perceive. The 
the question is, who is it or what is it that perceives and that chooses? Um, there is the belief and the feeling that I choose, and there is an experience also, that I choose, but behind the scene, there is an assumption that I is Magdi, that I is the body-mind. So when we say, I choose, we are assuming that we all understand that it is Magdi that chose. Now, when you look at Magdi or the body-mind, which I am, you ask yourself, well, which Magdi am I? Am I the Magdi of five minutes ago, the Magdi of a year ago, the Magdi of 20 years ago, the Magdi of five years old? Which, where and what is Magdi? So when you look at the body-mind which chooses, you, you are hard-pressed to find an actual fixed body-mind. You find that the body-mind is a series of thoughts, perceptions, sensations that in this moment, our experience of the body-mind is comprised of thoughts, images, perceptions, feelings, sensations. So when you question yourself that way, what is it that is choosing? Obviously it is I that chooses. It is not my dog or my fish or my car or my bank account that chooses, I choose. I make the choice. But the, the I as a body-mind, which is constantly shifting, constantly changing, hard to define, it makes you wonder how could something that is constantly changing and dissolving and appearing second by second, the thought of two seconds ago is gone. There is a new thought now. The image of a minute ago is gone. There is a new image now. The sensation, whatever sensation it was, is constantly changing. How could that make the choice? How could that be the chooser? Hmm given that it's shifting. The other thing that you could ask yourself is, can a series of perceptions, sensations, memories, which are objects of perception, in other words, I perceive the thoughts, I perceive the image, I perceive the image of Megdi 10 years old or of Mina, 20 year old Mina, I perceive memories, images, how could a series or a bundle of images and, and sensations, or, you know, choose, how can, how can a thought choose? How can a sensation choose? How could a perception choose? An object does not choose something that is perceived. Even if it's a subtle object, like a thought or a feeling, they're subtle there's still an object. Whether an object is gross, like for example, a tree, or an object is subtle, like a thought, they're both objects, they're both perceptions. They're both perceived. Hmm. So that which is perceived 
cannot be, cannot choose. It is just an object. An object cannot choose. A thought cannot choose a thought. A perception cannot choose a thought. A thought cannot choose a sensation. Yet we know from our experience that I choose, I chose to schedule this meeting. Now the question becomes, what is this I? For example, right now, I hear these words, right? I hear these words. What is the I that hears? The I that hears must be the I that chooses because I choose to turn the slide on or to turn it off. Boom, you know, I, cho I choose. Where is it? I choose to turn the light on or to turn the light off. The I that chooses and the I that perceives must be the same I. Let's put it another way. If there is a chooser, you have two options. Either the chooser is Santa Claus, meaning an imaginary, or the chooser is reality, has to be real, right? Because what's the point of talking about choice if we are talking about Santa Claus? We are only interested in talking about choice because we're interested in truth. We're interested in that which is real. So we look in our experience right now. What is it that is real right now? Because that which is real right now must be the reality that chooses and the reality that perceives. Hmm. There is only one candidate, which is consciousness, awareness. So in terms of choice, yes, there is a chooser. Yes, there is choice. Yes, there is free will. But the choice, the chooser and the free will does not belong to a bundle of images and thoughts and feelings, and it does not belong to the body-mind. It does not belong to the instrument of perception because the body-mind is a perfect, beautiful instrument of perception. We can perceive colors, sounds, shapes, sensations. But when you take a binocular, a very beautiful binocular, you spend thousand dollars on these binoculars <laughs> and you use the binoculars to watch to look at the birds beautiful birds in the distance in the forest because you love watching the birds it is not the binocular which perceives the binocular is a very perfect beautiful instrument that allows you to perceive the shades of color and the feathers of the, of the bird and how the bird moves from branch to branch. But it is not the binocular that perceives. It is I that perceives. I perceive. We confuse I with the body-mind. And the body-mind is mortal, meaning like the binoculars, after so many years, binoculars fall on the floor, whatever. Uh, your nephews, they take and I use the binocular, they go and they, the binocular falls in the lake, you lose the binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> the body mind is mortal, it is temporary, it is impermanent. But I, that which perceives consciousness, is not a body mind, it's not an object. It's not made out of atoms and molecules. Maybe the body is made out of atoms and molecules and the binoculars are made out of steel and whatever. But not I consciousness. So in terms of your understanding about the chooser, it is always I that chooses, but I, 
is consciousness. And consciousness, when you take a look at your experience right now, you don't find that consciousness or awareness is a female awareness or a male awareness, right? You don't find in your experience right now that awareness is 20 year old or 30 years old or 40 years old, right? Mm -hmm. It is not a form. Awareness is not a form. You don't find awareness to be liquid or solid or gas. You don't find awareness to be yellow or blue, red. You don't find awareness to be more in the morning from eight to 12 and less from 12 to 6 p.m. No, awareness is not in the realm of the relative realm of time and space. And what I'm talking about is not some concept. I'm talking about I, whatever you refer to, or whatever each one of us refer to as I right now, is this transparent awareness. From the mind perspective, meaning from the perspective of the senses, we give reality to that which is perceived. From the perspective of the senses, we say, the tree is real, the lake is real, the iceberg is real, the sound of the bird is real. Consciousness? Oh, that's an, something else, some other, <laughs> some other thing. That's from the, from the realm of the senses. But in fact, the tree appears and disappears. The iceberg appears and then melts. The birds, they come and then they migrate. What is it that does not come and go? The reality is not that which comes and goes. That which does not come and go is I awareness. So there is freedom of choice. We confuse the freedom of choice to be my personal freedom of choice. Me, the person, I have more freedom than you. But that's not the freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is God's freedom. It's the freedom of consciousness. And in fact, consciousness is exercising its freedom every moment in the creation of this experience right now. It is not a personal creation. I did not personally create this. I as Megdi, with this great mind and oh, I <laughs> those really scientists and we're creating this. <laughs> no. Consciousness is manifesting itself as this. It is manifesting itself as this and it is perceiving because the eye that perceives is not a man or a woman. The eye that perceives is invisible, infinite invisible. It's Transparent is awareness. Like, like in your night dreams. You know how in your night dreams you create all these images. You create them out of yourself. And you perceive your dreams. Simultaneously, you create them and you perceive them simultaneously. At the moment they're created, they're perceived. And at the moment that they're created and they perceive, they, you transform them. 
keep shifting. That's what's called a dream or a waking dream. And night dream and a waking dream, they have a similarity. So the choice, the will, the freedom and the creativity, they all belong to consciousness, to God in, in religious terms. So I, consciousness, conceive, create, perceive, and dissolve in one moment of eternity. In one moment of eternity, conceive, create, perceive, and dissolve. And in spite of my conception, creation, perception, and dissolution, I remain as I am. I am not diminished, nor am I augmented <laughs> by my creativity. So in terms of in your life, Mina, remind yourself whenever I am choosing to be clear that it is not the body-mind that is choosing. It is I consciousness that is choosing. And the more you comprehend that it is consciousness that is, that is choosing, the more you as consciousness will make the choice that is based upon love, upon wholeness, upon the well-being of all, and not just on behalf of your own personal self. Like the river, when the river is flowing, it is nourishing the land. It doesn't stop at any particular landowner. No, it nourishes this land and then the land downstream and downstream and downstream. That is how consciousness is. It is nourishing everything and everyone because everything and everyone it, it is its very creation. Yes, I, I see very clearly what you are talking about. And the, the only point here is exactly what you, what you said now, that it is for the whole, for the benefit of all beings and not selfish wanting something. But sometimes I, I feel like this surrendering is, it's, it's, I like that it is complete in, in the sense of sometimes you also act like it looks like the other is hurt or you say something to, to someone that for the moment it seems that, oh, why I told, why I said this like that, but maybe this one needs that it is said like that. And it is not, you know what I mean? For me, it's very hard in, in the terms of good and bad. I cannot decide what is good for the other, what is bad for him. Yes. Sometimes I, I, I find myself in a situation where I'm making something that uh, in the moment, it doesn't seem good. In, in the contrary, it seems like, oh, what was this? But maybe then I think maybe it came out like that because it was necessary to come like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends what's 
where you're coming from, what's behind the scene. If you are trying to protect your personal self or defend your personal self or justify your personal self, or whether you're, you're coming from perceiving a situation that requires a certain response without engaging in defending yourself or justifying yourself or protecting yourself, yourself meaning your, your ego, your image, your sense of me. Yes, there are, you know, with our children, we, we consider themselves as, we consider them as our own, as our very self. And sometimes we act in ways that are sort of, uh, they seem to be uh, hurtful. The child may cry, they get upset. But it's not meant that way. It's coming from a different place. It's coming from something you are perceiving. Now, it's possible that sometimes we are not perceiving clearly or we don't have enough data, we don't have enough information. And yet we feel that we need to make a decision just because the situation is telling us make a decision now. And we don't have enough data, so we make a decision and later we find out, oh, it was a wrong decision. But at the moment we made this, that we made the decision we did not have a crystal ball, we did not know. We did not have all the information, but we needed to make a decision. Now it's important that, as I said before, that the decision is not about me, my image, my pride, how people see me, or it's not about your ego. Rather the decision is about the situation or a certain relationship. So, a decision that may upset somebody else may not be a bad thing. We don't know. What matters is where you are coming from in your decision. Are you coming from the sense of separation? Or are you coming from a clear perception or a relatively clear perception of a situation? Yes, but for example, I make an example. You live with someone and both have a completely different conditioning, both like different things. For example, I like that it's or orderly, that it's uh, I have my space and, and my order but the other person is making completely the contrary, you know? Yes. He puts things inside and then, then I have the choice, shall I tell something or shall I tell nothing? And I remain hurt. Like I remain in a place where I don't like to be, but I am quiet for the peace or shall I defend my way of living or my way of seeing the things and my way of right. wanting to be? You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> right, I understand that. When you are on the dance floor with a partner, you dance in a certain way, your partner dances in a certain way. And so somehow, you are moving together, more or less harmoniously. Sometimes you step on his foot or her foot, and sometimes she steps on your foot, whatever. But it's, it's a dance. And it's, it's about enjoyment, about, about love, about sharing, about happiness. It's not some sort of contrived thing. So in, in life, it's a little bit similar in that if you suppress some things inside yourself and you live 
with a something suppressed inside of you, you, you're not happy. Yes. If you're not happy, it's not possible that one person is happy and the other person is unhappy. If you are unhappy, it's in the space for both of you. Yes. So at the same time, if you impose your will on the other, the other it will be unhappy and it's not possible for them to be unhappy and for you to be happy. So the unhappiness is, is just still there. So it's neither having your way or suppressing yourself. It's more dynamic. It's more interactive and it's alive. It's what we call life. Life is the reason it's interaction. This, and in this interaction, we are, if hopefully, we are learning and discovering some things about ourselves. We are learning how to, how to flow, how to be malleable and sometimes not, sometimes to take a stand. So it's both being malleable and sometimes taking a stand, but we don't know ahead of time. So the answer you're looking for, you cannot know it ahead of time. You can only know it in, in the moment. And so in the moment, if you find that you are suppressing yourself, then you have an information, you have information coming to you in the moment. And the information is unhappiness. Unhappiness is not the path, is, is not the, the correct direction. So this unhappiness is information for you to explore not just to explore within yourself, which of course is important, but to also explore in the relationship, in sharing, talking, uh, questioning, wondering, trying different things. Now, it is possible that certain dance partners, that don't, doesn't work. Some partner is just a beginner, beginner part dancer and another partner you know, so it's, it's not, it's not, you know, one partner needs to take more lessons, more <laughs> dance lessons to, to dance at a certain level, you see. So yes, yeah, sometimes it, it's not working. You try this, you try that, it's not working. And then, okay, then it's a different direction. So, We don't know ahead of time. And, and we have to be watchful that we may have patterns, patterns of hiding or avoiding or patterns of not hurting. We're not trying to hurt. I just say, okay, look, you know, it's really, it, it affects me when the dirty dishes are everywhere, you know? It's an expression, you're expressing yourself. It's important for you to express yourself. How you express yourself is important also. Not blaming or the other person may come from a totally different background than you, where they were the only child and they had servants that washed and cleaned everything for them. <laughs> so, then you, it's challenging. Yes. Because you, you like this person, you love them, you want to be with them, and it's challenging. And in life, we, we compromise a little bit. We, we, we make room for each other. It's yes. Part, yeah, it's part of part of the, the way, you know? Not to completely uh, be sort of just like the other person wants you to be. No, no you have to also be your own self, you know? In, in how the body-mind is expressing itself for you.
it's good for everybody to um, to explore the relationship with as much transparency, honesty, grace, and honesty towards yourself and as well as towards the other, you know? Yes. To honor everybody equally, including yourself. Thank you so much. Okay, Mina. Magdi, may I ask a follow-up question to what yes, Mina answer. Yes, absolutely. Hi. How are you, Magdi? Okay, nice to see you, Richard. That's nice to see you, too. Yes. Um, I, I've sort of been thinking about a way to ask the question, that, and then what, what you and Mina, Mina discussed maybe gave me a way to answer the question. Um, you, you give it a, a wonderful analogy of a, of a river that flows and you know that, that consciousness or awareness I, I don't I don't want to confuse the term so I apologize you know it is always flowing to, to, to nourish to nourish all um, and that's really the way we should try to to live um, but it, and, I, and I and I do certainly sometimes I've experienced this and I, and I do believe it to be true um, experienced that, it's not really the body mind that makes decisions or chooses. I understand that, and I have, to some degree, experience with that. But then I, I also have just, I don't know, that phenomenologically or introspectively, I have the sense that I can make bad decisions. Like that bad choices are made. Like, and by bad choices, that's where really I was trying to find the, the right language to use because I, I wasn't sure what I meant. But it seems that there's be sometimes that. I'll do something or I choose to do it or I'll do it as an instinct that is not harmonious and the choice does, does not nourish everyone. Um, you know, it could be something as simple as having an argument about with a partner about, you know, clean room or, you know, it could be you know, worse than that, you know, for example. Yeah. But so it seems to me that I often will feel that, oh, I made a choice that wasn't harmonious. But then I also don't think I really, that I really made the choice and I don't really understand how awareness or how consciousness could choose. I mean, is are there bad choices? Are, yeah. are there choices that don't? Yes. That truly don't. You know. You know, help everyone, or is that simply the theory? So I'm a little yeah. confused on the language. Maybe you could just talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I understand, uh, Richard. So, um, so consider the metaphor of the white light and the prism. So the white light hits the prism. When it hits the prism, it's deflected in infinite colors. So as it gets diffracted, then my world is a yellow world, your world is a pink world, his world is the yellow world, green world, etc. There are all these different worlds. And from that perspective, although the yellow world, the green world, the blue world, the pink world, they're all the light, they're all light. They do not, they're not the white light in that it is diffracted. So consciousness as a metaphor is like the white light. And via particular minds, it gets diffracted. It's get diffracted into my mind, your mind, my world, your world, my beliefs, your beliefs. 
as a metaphor. So from the perspective of the mind, meaning quotes unquote, the diffraction of the white light, post diffraction of consciousness, I perceive my world, my ideas, my beliefs, my tribe to be the good one. <laughs> I perceive your world, your tribe, and so on. It's okay, but it's not, you know, it's not the A tribe. <laughs> it's the B tribe. So I make my decisions. It is always I that is making the decision. But the I that is making the decision is the green I. And the I that is making the decision over there is the red I. Now, what is the reality of the red light and the blue light or the green light? Its reality is light. Its reality is light. So in our contemplation, in our inquiry about reality, about truth, we start from, I am the green light, you are the blue light. Every person starts with their own mind, their own beliefs. But where we look, the direction in which we look, we turn the direction back towards the prism. It's as if we are taking the light back. We're, we're doing the experiment, the prism experiment in reverse. We're taking the green light, the yellow light, the blue light back through the prism to realize, aha, my reality is the white light. It is not the green light. The world is not green. The world is not blue. The world is not pink. The world is transparent. Now, from the perspective of personal identification, the mind is conditioned. Every one of us, our mind is conditioned, conditioned by the past, conditioned by the events and the experiences that, that we had and the beliefs that came on board. Some beliefs, vary among body-mind and body-mind. But there is one common belief, which seven billion human beings, we share the same belief. The belief is that I am the body-mind, that I am born and that I will die. We all share this belief. And this belief is post the prism. On this side of the prism is consciousness. The belief on the other side of the prism is I am the body-mind. I am born. I am the instrument. So although the, that which chooses to make a choice is I consciousness, it is diluted. The I consciousness, which is making the choice, is mistaken by the mind to be I, Richard. In fact, Richard is not making any choice. There's only one chooser. Although Richard isn't making any choice, why? because there is no reality to Richard. The reality of Richard, first of all, to be clear, what do you mean by Richard? By Richard, we mean, you have to take a look for yourself. When I look at by Magdi, what do, we mean, what do I mean? I mean images, perceptions. I perceive a body which I call Magdi. My mama called this body Magdi, you know? Okay, that was, that's what she chose, okay? So it's perception and sensation. For example, the sensation of my feet on the ground. And so, so Megdi is something I experience, is, an, is something I experience, I experience. So there isn't an actual fixed Megdi because my experience is constantly changing. When I say my experience, I'm referring to whatever it is that truly experiences, truly perceives, which is consciousness. So in fact, 
although there is an impression that Richard is making a choice, there is no Richard and there is no choice that Richard is making. But from the perspective of the dream, of the belief that Richard is making a choice, there is the impression, the mind impression, which is passing, that Richard is making a choice and that Richard made the wrong choice. Why? Why is that the impression Richard made the wrong choice? There is an impression of Richard made, made the wrong choice because within the imaginary chooser, choosing an imaginary choice, because the, an imaginary chooser cannot make a real choice. It can only make imaginary cho choices. Within the imaginary realm of choosing, there was a preference, which is also an illusory imaginary preference. And this preference is always opposed by its non-fulfillment. The only thing that is not opposed by its non-fulfillment is the no preference, the absence of preference. The absence of preference is not opposed by its non-existence. So in the realm of consciousness, there are no preferences or another way of saying it, consciousness prefers everything equally. But anyways, I may be digressing. No, you're, no, no, you're, you're, you're okay. not. Because um, this is sort of... I just wanted to say one, finish one thing. Yes, yes, of course. Is, so the, so the, the, the wrong choice is a mind impression. There is no such thing as wrong choice in truth. But in the realm of separation, meaning in the realm of illusion, there is good and bad. In God's kingdom, there is no good and bad. But in the mind, in, in, in the human mind, let's say, is full of good and bad. Like in your night dream, uh, Richard, in your night dream, you may be uh, gambling at the casino and losing a lot of money and that's very bad because you are wasting the fortune of your family at the casino and it feels awful and it's really awful and your, your partner is upset with you and also bad things are happening and you're making the bad choices. You are making the bad choices until you wake up. When you wake up, where was, what is Richard? Where are, where is the casino? Where, where are the million dollars that you lost? At? Where is the upsetness of your partner? It was all a dream. <clears throat> Yet having said that, it is important to wake up from the dream. I am not the type of guy that says, oh, it's all a dream, forget it's all a dream. No, it is, you need to wake up from the illusion of separation. Because the illusion of separation is unhappy. It's full of bad choices. The first bad choice, Richard, is choosing separation. So my question, had, because everything you said sort of was exactly along sort of the train of thought that I, that I find myself on with this. And you explained, I can go into detail, but you explained some things that I, I couldn't quite think through, but are there, are, so I know, I think what you mean, at least one thing that you mean, you say like, don't, you know, it's all the dream, live the dream. I know you're not advocating that do whatever you want it doesn't matter. It's not a nihilism. I understand. I understand that. But at the same time, do do, do any choices that I make in the dream matter? Yes. As far as being able to arrive to yes. move towards. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. That's a good that? question. Good question, Richard. Yes. Let me speak a little bit of that. It's very important. You know, as long as we believe ourselves to be. A, Magdi, to be Richard, to be the mortal body mind. There is no need to play the game of, oh, well, I'm consciousness. It's BS. 
you know, it's BS. Okay, look, I understand that the there is consciousness, I am consciousness, the reality of that, but I still feel and I'm experiencing myself as being this person. So as long as you're experiencing yourself to be a person and you are a student of the way, meaning a student of truth, you do your best compassionately, kindly, sweetly, gently, not judgmentally. You do your best to, in whichever way are possible for you, to align your decisions, richest decisions, with how consciousness would, for example, do it. <laughs> so it's creative process. And, and we, have, we, we have the opportunity here together to explore uh, and to get hints from each other about what's a better direction. When you are making a decision, definitely you want to follow what feels good and happy for you and for everybody as much as you can. We don't know what that is ahead of time, but just to be open to that possibility of, okay, what sort of decision can I make here that includes not just my well, my well-being, of course, my well-being is very important, but also that's, that works for, for the others involved, okay? And there may be a price to pay. So uh, am I willing, am I available, am I open to paying this price? Sometimes, no, I'm not. Sometimes, yes, I am. So uh, it's not, it, there may be some, adjustments that you will find yourself needing to make and maybe willing to make. You don't know, you don't know. So the direction is to make your choices on behalf of the whole and take my word for it for now that this path is the path of fulfillment and the path of abundance for everyone. Yeah, and, and I, I have experienced a, a, a glimpse of that in, yeah. our, in our, yes. our time. So I, I do take your word for it, but I also have experienced that. Yes, yes, beautiful. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Thank, thank you so much, Mandy. Yes. Thank you, Mina, for helping me think of it. Oh, wonderful. That's a good, very good question, important question. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. Any questions? Hi, Maggie, it's Esther. Esther, hello, Esther. Hi there. Hey. You know, what you shared today, <clears throat> uh, it was so important. I remember in the beginning of this path or somewhere along the way, it was like, um, <clears throat> I thought all the bad decisions were done by the ego and all the good ones were if I were present. And I had a hard time sorting that out um, because there is no, like you said to Richard, <laughs> there's, there's no one making, there's no Richard, no Esther, no. And, and more and more, you know, I really see that truth of that. But for the longest time, I just, I couldn't believe that consciousness would make some of the choices mm -hmm. <laughs> that I seem to be making, you know? So I do appreciate your words today very much along that line. Yes. You know, in a way, uh, Esther, it is one of the ways in which the sense of separation maintains itself is via uh, self-judgment. 
Um, and the, uh, the, the, the fraction of the mind between good and bad. In fact, goodness has no opposite. If, if goodness had a, an edge, a limit, <laughs> what sort of goodness would that be? It's going to be good across the board. <laughs> that which is good, it's going to be good across the board. So love has no opposite. There isn't hate is the opposite of love, no. Love is, it's absolute. From the mind perspective, it's always diffracting this versus that, this versus that. And behind the scene, behind this diffraction, there is me. Because this whole process is about me. Either I am bad and he's good or she's good or I'm good. It's, it's not just some absolute goodness and badness. No, it is about the personal self, about the sense of separation, this versus that. Although, in fact, all is love, all is God's light. As long as it's not absolutely clear to us, we are open for this clarity. We say there is room, I welcome the clarity. Welcoming the clarity is already the clarity. Because we are not placing any conditions such as, oh, what do I need to do? How long is this going to take me? Sometimes people say, oh, I've been meditating for 12 years, 20 years. <clears throat> That's not a welcoming. There's some sort of condition behind the scene, you see. So in terms of the clarity, we welcome the clarity. And at the same time, we are sincere and honest with ourselves. The honesty is to be sincere about what your experience is. Not how you are interpreting your experience, but at the feeling level, because eventually it doesn't matter so much the interpretation, but how, what is, what, what is the taste? What is the flavor? What is the perfume of your experience? So in, in our experience, we, we become more and more sensitive to the unhappiness. And the unhappiness that before used to irritate us, now it sort of interests us. We're interested, mm, interesting. Let's see what's the, what is that? Let's, let me explore that. Let, me, let it explore myself. Let it come. Let, I wanna, I wanna, so it becomes interesting, you see. And our interest already is the love. Already is the love. It's going to come to us because it's, we're interested, you know, like we, when you have a baby and you try to call the baby to you, they don't, they don't really want to come. But when you're just available, the baby feels somehow some, there is a space within you that welcomes the baby. You find the baby walking towards you, coming to you, you see. So in a way, it's a little bit like that. But yes, you know, consciousness is love, it's sweet. It's, it doesn't know good and evil. It is the reality of being or the one reality. As this one reality, all is love because there are not two 
in love, the two become one. The two are one in love. We have the understanding, which is the viveka, the discrimination between the real and the unreal. The real is that which doesn't move, doesn't come and go. And everything, everything else is its reflection. But the sense of me does not refer to any reality. It simply refers to the conditioned body-mind. And we recognize that living the sense of me is what feeds it. And rather, as best we can, we live as this transparent presence that has nothing to defend, is not trying to preserve itself. <laughs> Or achieve itself. And at the body mind level, it is this deep relaxation, so deep and so vast that. You can compare it to the vastness of the universe and beyond. And we we also notice the subtle the more and more subtle tendencies within the body to contract maybe around the shoulders, the hands, the face. And we invite these contractions to come home and to rest in the vastness of their true nature. Thank you, Magdi. Lovely to see you, Esther. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, dear friends, very lovely to be with you all. Thank you for your uh, presence, your love, your company, your questions, Marga, Holger, hello Holger, Esther, Raul, Emeline, Karen, Nina. Thank you, Magdi. John, Kelly, Frank, George, Richard, Stephen, Peter. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Magdi. Thank you, Magdi. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Magdi. Thank you all.